All right. Um, welcome, everybody, to your last talk of the day. Um, my name is Vipul Sabaya. I work for HP. Uh, this is George Lorch. Uh, he's a developer at Percona. And uh, we're going to talk about some of the features that we've uh, asked Percona to build, as well as some of the features that they've built themselves uh, in order to support Percona's server within Trove. So a couple of years ago, I'll just start with the HP angle of this. A couple of years ago, HP uh, decided that we wanted to run databases as a service in a public cloud sort of uh, environment. Um, at the time, Trove supported MySQL, and HP made the decision that we would support the Percona implementation of MySQL as the primary offering. Um, quickly, we realized that running MySQL as a service and pr giving customers access to MySQL uh, in, in a cloud environment was pretty difficult. Um, there was many ways that customers could break the system. Uh, and it would break the ability for Trove to manage that system. Um, so we partnered with Percona. Um, we started talking about some of the features that we could build uh, that are not necessarily in MySQL, but they could be in Percona. Um, that allows us to sort of harden uh, the database as a service offering that we would provide. Uh, so we're going to talk about those features. Um, we're going to talk about how they intersect with Trove um, and how you guys can also use these same features because they're actually available in upstream Percona um, in your own Trove installations. Okay, so is this on? Yeah. Can you hear me? Um, so we'll start off the, a quick overview of some of the different features that we've got uh, that we've, we've implemented and negotiated with, uh, with uh, HP over the time. Uh, and as we discussed earlier, they're not actually necessarily using every aspect of every feature that's in there, but it's there. Um, and in some cases, it, you, uh, you should be able to make use of them yourself if you choose within, uh, within Trove. So some of the first things, first issues they ran into were securing, uh, well, I should back up a bit. Uh, Trove uses this concept of a uh, controlling client that needs to get access to the database to be able to manipulate things, say, like set up, setting up replication and uh, other administrative tasks like that, maybe resetting a, a, the, a, the root user password, uh, things of that nature. And it does this through the, the Trove client, or I'm sorry, the, the Trove agent on, uh, in the instance. Well, that agent needs access to MySQL via a proper user. So there was, a, that there was an issue with the end users potentially deleting this user and, and other security things. So we have a feature that handles some of that. We've got uh, some different ongoing research um, regarding trying to keep the MySQL instance from really uh, falling apart once it hits no space situations. And there's numerous and numerous ways that you can hit no space, either from just running out of space by adding too much data or having a, a poorly designed app that uses very large and long transactions. Um, so there's a, there's a couple of different ways that uh, space management comes into play within these environments as well. So, uh, log files, binary logs, things like that. Uh, we've got several uh, integration points and some new things right now on the horizon with, that occur between Percona Server and Percona Extra Backup that will allow your backups to execute uh, either uh, more efficiently or with less locking on the server. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about that. And we've got uh, features now in Extra Backup that will allow, uh, allow you to use Extra Backup itself to help you secure your backup stream as you're, and compress it as you're backing it up. Uh, there's encryption, uh, compression, parallelization. Um, and we've just released an alpha version of our uh, streaming to Swift that, will, uh, that uh, Extra Backup can do now natively rather than needing some secondary scripting to handle that for you. And we're just going to kind of discuss how all of these things intersect with Trove and how uh, you can either alter your Trove uh, deployment to make use of these and how HP has actually come to use it within their own, uh, with their, within their own stack. Okay. So the, the way this is going to work a little bit is I'm going to talk about some of the Trove integration aspects and then we're going to defer to the MySQL expert and talk about how they actually implemented the feature. Uh, so the first one here is the utility user. Um, so again, as George uh, mentioned, Trove runs a guest agent alongside uh, the database process. Um, and Trove also supports certain APIs uh, that require the guest agent to talk to the local database. Um, 
What Trove typically does on first boot is it creates a OS admin user. Um, this user is basically uh, a user that's reserved for the guest agent, and the OS admin user um, is able to, so the guest agent is able to talk to the database going forward using that user. Um, the problem with this is that uh, somebody, you know, outside of the Trove API, if you log into the MySQL instance, they could actually drop the OS admin user. Um, what that means is our ability to sort of manage that uh, MySQL instance is forever broken. Um, so the, the one thing that we wanted um, uh, Percona to support was uh, the concept of a utility user, a user that doesn't actually exist in the user's table. Um, it's a hidden user. And we also wanted them to support us specifying sort of the privileges and the permissions that this user has so that we don't necessarily have a back door into the customer data. So we could limit things like, hey, yeah, allow the user to create schemas, create users, other users, but don't allow them access to read from customer uh, database schemas, things like that. Um, so uh, George is going to talk about how they actually implemented that feature. Yeah. This, this was actually a really interesting. This was one of the first uh, tasks that I had when I came to, uh, to Percona. Um, and it was quite, quite a, uh, an interesting thing to try to do because the, uh, the MySQL, internally the MySQL user system is um, actually fairly simple and also fairly complex at the same time. So wedging this guy in there was, was a bit of a challenge. And uh, as Vipul says, where were we at here? Yeah, the, the utility user, um, one of, the, one of the, the requirements that kind of came out was we didn't want the people that were actually using the, uh, the hosted database to get the feeling that they were being spied on or, or have any kind of a hint of impropriety. So uh, there were several different um, mandates, really, that came along with this user. Uh, mainly is the, some, if somebody had root access, they could not see this user anywhere. It wouldn't show up in the user's table. It wouldn't show up in any kind of grants. It, wouldn't it just wouldn't show up anywhere. It's got to be completely invisible to the end user. Um, other other issues with it were uh, how to how to give it the right rights so that it could tiptoe around the system to do its job without giving it too many rights that would compromise the function the purpose of the user and, and allow uh, per perhaps a rogue employee or somebody uh, access to data where they shouldn't have it. Go to the next slide. So it's pretty easy to specify. I don't. Uh, it's documented well. I don't really think we need to get into details here, but there's basically allowed one user per system, ut utility user per system. Um, you can give them uh, a password, um, and you can, sp you can specify the typical MySQL user syntax of if you want it only from a certain host, or if you want local host, or if you want wildcarded, and so on. And you can uh, this user, as Vipul mentioned as well, can have sp uh, privileges to certain uh, databases on the system. So if you want this user to be basically nothing but like a password reset user type thing, then you would only need access to uh, the, the MySQL users table. Um, if you wanted to be able to do more, then you can give it more scope of access to different data store databases on the system. Okay, we're yeah, the, the user, as I mentioned, it, he can't be modified by anybody. Uh, nobody can see him, nobody can delete him. It's there, it's there for good forever. Uh, it won't sh appear in any of the user, client, or thread stats. Um, the, o uh, any, the only thing that might show up would be if this user starts executing interesting queries in the system, it will show up in the slow log, the general query log, and things like that. Um, that was actually kind of an accident and intentional because <laughs> It was an accident because I did, we didn't even think about that when we were developing it. It's showing up in the logs, and somebody wrote up a bug that, hey, you know, if I log in as this user and go and start executing uh, big uh, inserts, it's showing up and it's, it starts appearing in the logs. And then we're thinking about it, well, you know what, that actually makes sense. Because if this guy's out there deleting your data, reading your data, doing something to, to your data, you want to know about it. So it will show up in the logs then, and it will raise a red flag for the customer. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, the, this user may modify system variables uh, based on other normal constraints on things that you'll see later on. So if you needed to do something, do some maintenance to the server or change something, uh, if you needed to turn into DBA mode, you, this, you can log in with this user and actually, uh, um, actually modify some system state. Um, and it can see, create, modify other users within the system. 
and it, it can control basically all of the higher level functions of the server. It can bootstrap replication, configure rep replica slaves, things like that. Um, the, there are obvious constraints. It must not be the same, or it must not qualify the same as any other user on the system. And if a client try, this is the this last bullet point is really one of the only places where an end user might get a hint that this user exists is if they try to create a user that matches this user, uh, this user's spec. It'll kick back an error for them, but they still won't see the username of it, but they'll know what it is. So if you do use the feature, use a bizarre username, use a, a, you know, a UUID or something like that. Uh, there's some interesting behaviors with it. So with this user, you can grant it either a spe specific set of MySQL uh, grant rights or you can give them access to specific schemas or a combination of both. So if you only, say, give him you know, a replication uh, control, but yet you still give him access to another complete database, he'll have full access rights to that database regardless of what the replication control states. So there's, there's some, you know, some tiptoeing and, and decision making that you have to think about if, uh, before you use it. And that's pretty much it for the utility user. So uh, th there's, th there's actually a lot of weird detail that we could get into with it. But you know, in the uh, sense of time, we're, it's probably unnecessary here unless anybody. So we'll, we'll, we'll pause for questions if you guys have. And we'll, if not, then we'll just move on to the next thing. Yeah, any, any questions on the user? OK. Come on, Doug. I know you've got something. <laughs> <laughs> He's reserving. Wake up. If he had access to it and it was and you had your slow query log or general query log on, yeah. Mm -hmm. Nope. Nope. It, if they do, write it up, it's a bug. All right, uh, so the next category here is options modifier. Uh, so Trove currently supports an API basically that allows the user to uh, set configuration options on their, on, on their data store. Uh, we call that config groups. Um, and within Trove, we have the ability to sort of restrict and control values that certain uh, configuration parameters can have. Um, but MySQL obviously supports uh, you know, dynamic session level variables, so a user could theoretically skip the Trove API and you know, try to set a variable that you know, uh, bypasses the ability for Trove to validate. Uh, so if the user were to do that directly, we wanted to also be able to limit sort of what options and what values a user could specify and whether they could even, you know, there are certain variables that we could completely hide from the user. Um, so that's kind of what you know, the, this feature ended up being, uh, the ability to sort of control what options, whether it's dynamic or whether it's a my.conf variable, uh, that MySQL would honor. Yeah, the, um, upstream MySQL actually has the concept of options modifiers. And uh, when I got to this task, I was actually kind of puzzled because it just seemed like half-baked. Like they had some, some things you could do, but, uh, well, for example, like what I mentioned today, you could set a maximum on a value, but you couldn't set a minimum. I, I mean, why would you even go through the effort of setting the, uh, writing the code for one when you could write almost the same, use the same identical code for the, for the second? So uh, yeah, the idea is that we want to keep the end users from shooting themselves in the foot. Um, so that way, uh, you know, you're, uh, as a hoster, hosting provider, um, you're not getting DBA calls. Oh, gee, I changed this value, and uh, now my database is not working. So this allows you to set up some reasonable limits for whatever options you think you may need to, um, just to, for for that sized instance that you that uh, the user is uh, purchased. Um, let's see, yeah, the, this slide kind of explains how upstream options modifiers work. Um, it's documented as well, but I had it here for reference. Uh, the currently. The ones that MySQL supports these, yeah, these these five options: uh, enable, disable, loose, which are usually not used on a actually running, actively running to, uh, instance. They're used for uh, various bootstrapping uh, functions. They support the maximum option. That's that was one they have. So you can you know cap a value. So if, if you set the maximum of a of something to say 100 and the user tries to set it to 105, 
uh, they'll get a warning and it just gets set to 100. Um, they also have the skip option, which allows you to uh, tell MySQL to basically ignore the processing or function of this value if it sees it anywhere in a comp file. So this is what upstream has. And it's not really what is really needed to, to fully box in a MySQL instance. So we added in the minimum, which behaves just like maximum. You, uh, you can set some minimum threshold of a rational value. Uh, and if a user tries to set it lower than that, the warning spits out, and they, it gets bounced to the minimum value. But the ones that were really particularly interesting were the hidden and read-only options. Uh, since in MySQL, basically, uh, system, everything is system var variables. You can see everything about and, or learn a lot about the machine that it's running on just by looking through the existing system variables. There's paths in there, like data dirs and all that kind of stuff. Figured maybe somebody wants to hide them or wants to make them so the u end user can't change them. So with these two options, you can, you, you can basically either make something hidden or fully read-only to the end user. They will not show up in you know, uh, any command line uh, means of, uh, of taking a, a peek at the values. And they're pretty simple to use. So with this, this is now we have like a nice round package of, way, uh, of options modifiers that allow you to just really kind of harden down an instance, just let the user change the few things that make sense to their workload, and then the rest of the stuff is hands off. So they can't go and blow uh, some value that maybe goes out and allocates more memory than the box has, you know, and just shoots themselves in the foot. And it also allows you to protect yourself a little bit. You can obscure or hide various bits about the install so they can't see what's, and get a hint as to what's underneath. Okay. So any questions on the modifiers? Okay. All right, so enforcing a storage engine. Uh, this is another feature that we had Percona build. Um, it, we wanted a way to sort of restrict the uh, storage engine that a, a user could create a schema under. Um, given that InnoDB is a much more reliable and it's got the ability to you know, recover from crashes a lot better than my ISM, we wanted to sort of make our service a little bit more hands-off um, and force the user to actually have InnoDB as the only uh, storage engine that they get. Um, so one of the issues with running you know, a, a public cloud database service is that we have many, many instances, right? Lots of customers using the service. And we have limited resources, so we can't really, you know, we can't be a DBA for all these customer instances. Um, so our choice of, you know, restricting the engine allows us to sort of get out of the business of supporting individual databases if they crash, and we don't have to go and manually recover things. You know, NODB is going to do a much better job. It's also important um, when we talk about backups because we can do backups, you know, without doing a flush table, um, and we'll talk about that a little bit more later. Um, but the, the main idea is that there is an option in Percona Server that allows you to sort of um, restrict what storage engines are available and visible to the user. Yeah. Uh, not yet. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, uh, this one was. I mean, it's it's kind of self-explanatory. Um, there are a couple of area. There are one specific area where it gets a little interesting. Um, and yeah, you can go to the next next slide. Is the way this would interact with uh, uh, the SQL mode with the engine substitution flag. So it, it, all it really comes down to is whether or not the user is going to get an error um, or if we're just going to switch the engine on them during the, the, the create statement. So because SQL mode is obviously something that they can set as a system variable or as a uh, SQL is a session variable too, right? Peter's asleep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so you, you can, so that way, if the, it, there's really not any way to kind of force them to accept the behavior one way or another. They're just going to have to know that this is what's going on. So if, if they've got an engine forced to be inodb and they try to do my ISAM and, and they get an error, they're going to be like, oh, well, what's going on? So that's, that, I, again, that was, that's a pretty straightforward one, but it's actually pretty valuable because of, specifically because of the recovery. You know, if somebody goes and shuts down their instance with my ISAM with a bunch of tables open, middle of a huge insert, um, and then fires it back up and wonders where their data went, and it's, you know, <laughs> they don't want to get the phone call. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, any questions on that one? Oops. Okay, uh, the next yeah. uh, uh, feature that we added to Percona was um, 
around preventing certain operations, uh, for preventing the user from running certain SQL commands. Um, so Trove uh, treats every instance essentially like a black box. The end user doesn't necessarily have the ability to SSH onto the instance. Um, the only uh, interface to the instance is the MySQL uh, protocol. Um, and again, Trove, a Trove instance is not a file system. Uh, we don't want the user to write arbitrary data within a Trove instance. Um, there's also a, other configuration files that are on that instance. Um, because we have the guest agent running on the instance, uh, there's configuration for the guest agent. Uh, there could be credentials to RabbitMQ um, and other things that we just don't want people to read. Um, so explicitly disabling load data in file and select and add file basically allows us to properly secure the database and it prevents the user from reading and uh, writing to that file system. So I mean, these are options that we actually have in our public cloud offering. Yeah, this, this was another, uh, it, it's pretty self-explanatory, it's simple, but its impact is fairly huge because with, without the ability to restrict this in place, uh, an end user could theoretically probe the entire file system by trying you know, load, load data in file and doing whatever they want. They could also, again, shoot themselves in the foot by constantly dumping into out file you know, stuff all over the place that the, the Trove agent's got no idea what's there, doesn't know to clean it up. It has, it's, so they could be completely out of disk space and not know where it came, where it went. Yeah, Amra? Uh, potentially, but the thing is, is the, uh, the app would still have access to like the data directory, so they could still dump stuff into the data directory and, um, uh, you know, as, and just consume space. Uh, but yeah, as far as getting outside of the, the, the existing or the allowed access data area, yeah, you're right, you could use anything else. But then that's, you know, that's also one more tool or thing you need to make sure you have in your image. Yeah, I, I wouldn't. I don't know. I, yeah, <laughs> I'm it, not an image maker. Does. I mean, like if you if you have Ubuntu as the you know host, you automatically yeah. get App Armor. So yeah. Um, yeah, they get they get an error, the they'll get an error back. <laughs> I, I forget the exact wording and which error number it was. Um, I think we were able to repurpose one of the existing error numbers. I, I forget exactly which one it, what, which one it was. Huh? What was that? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> oops. Um, now the need to actually do a load data in file still exists, right? I mean, somebody might, you know, if they got their data somewhere, they want to shove it up there, or if they've got a dump, they want to try to restore. So load data local in file actually still works, but that is, if you're not familiar with it, it's, um, you can connect from a MySQL client from any other machine and then upload a file from your local machine and it will populate. So you do have to go through the, you know, across the network through the protocol and all that for that. Um, uh, but it's, so you still have that ability, you just can't, can't do it remotely. Okay, I think we already had some questions yeah. about this. But. All right, uh, so uh, again, just iterating on the getting out of the business of supporting individual uh, customer instances. Um, disk space usage is definitely one of the bigger issues that we hit with our customers. Um, typically, uh, Users create a small instance, uh, they forget to you know, resize their volume, or they forget to resize their instance, and we quickly run out of disk space. Um, so this is especially important now that Trove <laughs> supports replication, that we have the ability to sort of limit the, the size of the bin log, as well as the number of bin log files that can exist on a VM. Um, it just becomes one less thing that could fill up your system. Um, so Trove is also able to take you know, the information when provisioning an instance, such as the flavor or the volume size, and properly set these values when the MySQL starts up. Yeah, uh, Upstream already had, has uh, the maximum big bin log size, and it's, a, it's your typical, you know, I want maximum n number of files, and I want each one to be maximum of this size. So with that, you pretty much have n now a known constant of how much disk space your bin logs are gonna take. Um, and with, when it gets to replication, you know, you have to think about this as to, you know, as to how much replication lag you might want to, you might expect because if you get too deep, then now you're rolling past your ability to stay caught up. Um, but what MySQL didn't have was anything for slow log. If somebody went in to their CLI and, you know, started enabling slow logging or, or anything like that, or if uh, Trove, once it gets to the point of being able to create, capture, and collect logs, 
uh, oh, I'm gonna, uh, let me turn this on. I've got some trouble on this machine. You forget about it. You know, four days later, your disk is full because it's, you, you just got now gigabytes of, slow, of log files. So we basically took the same concept and implemented it for slow logs. So now slow logs will rotate in pretty much the same way. You can specify number of files, number of size. Yes, Doug? Yeah, the same issue does exist with general log, but for uh, in, in most cases, people don't you don't use general logging. I mean, you're going to use if you're looking for for uh, you know errant queries and that you're using slow log. Um, but that's actually an interesting question, and I remember it being asked at the before. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. I think that's another feature. Actually, not that's not even on the slide. That's day. not. Yeah, that's not yeah. on this. Yeah, that's not on this list. And that, we talked about that. That's early. the logging has been uh, with Trove and and the work that we've done with HP has been uh, has been an issue for a while. But the as a forward looking issue because the reality is right now. I mean, you, they've got no way of even seeing them or getting them off the box, really. You, you know. So, but now that we're getting to that point, it's probably something worth discussing out. You know, in the summit. And, yeah, I think tomorrow we're going to talk about how to expose some of these logs to Swift or something, and I think you know this is going to help uh, sort of control the size of yeah. uh, some of those logs. I mean, so. and, and yeah, and as, as mentioned, the main the main idea was just to keep somebody from just from turning something on, forgetting about it, and then wondering why they ran out of disk space three days later, because it happens. <laughs> okay. So, questions on that? <laughs> yeah, seriously. Nah, don't don't worry about it. We're all friends here. It's a pattern. <laughs> All right, so uh, this is another item. Um, this one isn't quite solved yet. Um, it's another feature sort of to limit how much disk uh, MySQL uses. Uh, so each time, whenever there's a transaction that occurs, uh, MySQL is actually you know, storing an undo log for that transaction. Um, there's currently no way to sort of limit how, how big that undo log is going to get. Um, so Percona is still actually figuring out how, yeah. how to implement this correctly. Um, but essentially, it would be a way that this doesn't fill up, as well as allows NODB to sort of recover automatically. Um, yeah, this this is a uh, is a tough one because um, uh, it it crosses horizontally and verti vertically through inodb um, in a in a pretty tough way. It's a uh, uh, the the issue really is is that uh, as uh, the pool mentioned that you can, if you could do, say, do a you know start transaction and then just start inserting a ton of data, um, or if load data in file was allowed and you had a huge table, you end up with this monstrous transaction. And if you don't commit it, um, you're going to have a couple of things. First, you're going to start creating purge lag because uh, the purging thread is never going to be able to push its way through um, the undo space and get finished, which is a totally different topic. But but the main thing is is it's it's taking up all this space in, well, in MySQL, MySQL 5.5 in your uh, primary system table space, and in 5.6 you're allowed to put it into a secondary table space, but it's still space on disk. It, this stuff is just still stake, taking up space. And there's no way to prevent the user uh, or the app writer from doing something that would cr cause a runaway undo space growth. And this is, this is actually an age-old kind of a common problem with MySQL. Yes, Amrith. Yeah, that's no. My my SQL's undo log is for any change. Well, in, in, um, yeah, you're right. You're right. You're right. Actually, that was that is a type. No, I, well, there there is a. Yeah, that's what. Yeah, it's 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 the. There's well, there's insert, delete, and it's been a while since I've been in this code. It's, it's so, I uh, you know. Um, we can actually talk about it out offline, but yeah, the, it, it is there is growth. There is there is growth. Um, so anyway, the, the thing is, is that, yeah, it will it can run away, run away from you, and there's just no way to set a high watermark or something to say, hey, you know what, this tra transaction has just gotten out of hand. Let's let's chop it at the knees. Okay. And so that leads there's a there's actually a bug, surprise, in <laughs> deep down in InnoDB, where um, you can get into a situation where if you hit no space on a transaction, the transaction fails and needs to roll back. 
during the process of rollback, assuming that you had other operations going on, it may need to do a deep uh, page split. And in order to do a page split to, un to reapply the undo log or undo, it needs to go get more space. So you end up in this basically uh, this uh, deathly embrace where your, your server is now irrecoverable until you give it more disk space. Um, it's a hard bug to hit, but we have, people, have had people hit it. Uh, it particularly actually shows up if you're using any kind of uh, disk space quotaing um, on XFS was at where it was reported again, against. So we're doing research. We've got some ongoing tasks where we're just trying to figure out, you know, what's a rational way to kind of keep this tamp down for, so, the, again, users don't shoot themselves in the foot. They don't go and use, chew up a tremendous amount of this undo space that is now not usable for anything else because I know DBs, once, once a page is marked for undo, that's it. It's undo forever. So it's a, you know, it can create a pretty nasty situation. Um, some of the things that you can do to kind of help get around this bug or prevent it from happening is you'll you drop a dummy file out on the file system, uh, just enough for a couple of hundred pages or whatever, you know, just some small fraction of a percent of your disk space. So if they do hit this bug, they do run out of space, server goes down, is unrecoverable, you delete this file, bring it back up, let it regrow, let it apply everything, roll through the, uh, um, the recovery process, and at least get your server back into a running state so that way you now have an opportunity to, to, to move your data around or, or do something with it. So that's, that's, that's a one possible workaround. So. But beyond that, uh, yeah, these are links to, oh, they don't really show up that well, do they? There's links to different bugs and blog posts on, um, on this particular issue with the, with, the, uh, with the bug and if you're really interested in it, in the morbid details. Okay. Any questions on this? All right, uh, so another area that we've uh, worked with Procona is around backups. Um, so Trove supports a, a backup API that uh, allows you to take full backups as well as incremental backups. And uh, for the MySQL guest implementations, we leverage Procona uh, extra, extra backup. Uh, so as we're taking the backup, we're also encrypting the backup and directly streaming that backup to Swift. Um, the encryption, the streaming, it's, it's all handled currently by the guest agent. Um, and we're using XP stream to sort of get a hold of the stream, pipe it to open SSL, and pipe it back to uh, a Swift handler. Uh, so the code is pretty complex. Uh, we probably want to get rid of it at some point uh, from the guest agent um, and make this a general you know, feature with an extra backup. Uh, so the, the, one of the feature requests we have is to implement the streaming and uh, encryption capabilities uh, natively with an extra backup. Um, as well as to sort of uh, store all the backups that have occurred in, in, the, in the actual customer database instance. Um, so uh, I think that's... Yeah, okay, I can... Yeah. There's a, so there, yeah, there's a couple of, uh, as mentioned, there's integration points between Percona Server and Extra Backup that don't exist with Upstream because, well, they haven't absorbed the code. Um, so, uh, there's, so there's ways to make backups. Uh, uh, one particular feature is the incremental uh, change page bitmap uh, setting. What it does is uh, the server starts maintaining just a, a bitmap of what pages have changed since some previous, you know, marked point in time. When you go to do a backup, the, an incremental backup, it says, okay, hey, I know that uh, at that, this particular LSN is where I'm going to start at, um, and it will then just pick up these, the pages that have changed or been marked as changed rather than having to do a complete scan of all pages on disk to say, hey, have you changed yet? Oh, no, all right. Have you changed yet? No. So uh, this was released, I think, about a year, year and a half ago. It was uh, last, uh, not this past year's Percona Live, but the one before it. Um, and uh, Lornis, who did most of the work on it, did actually some interesting benchmarks and discovered that the server appears to suffer, suffer absolutely no uh, lag or delay or, or um, decrease in performance because of the tracking. But the backup, if you actually have a reasonably, from, from either a very light to a very heavy workload, it it's, it's performs almost perfectly linear based on the number of pages changed. So no longer do you have this long, long page scan that needs to take place. So if you only have a couple of pages changed, the backup executes really like that. If you've got a complete set of change pages, it performs almost exactly the same as if the feature didn't exist. So it was, it was really interesting because we were expecting to take a ding somewhere on it, but 
So, uh, but that feature is in Percona Server, and it's pretty easy to turn on. Um, an extra backup will detect it automatically when it fires up. Um, the other uh, more recent feature that is actually really cool, this is, this is, this is the killer one here, is the lightweight locks. Um, when extra backup executes a backup, uh, if it's, for inodb, it's basically just copying pages off disk and tracking the, uh, the log positions, copying it out so it can reapply the changes after the backups, uh, well, when the backups are ready to be prepared. But when it gets to the point where it needs to finalize what LSN, what positions it's actually backed up to, uh, as well as backing up my ISAM data, it needs to execute a flush table with read lock, which basically just puts a halt to all changes uh, for the time, for the duration that it's being, uh, being executed. So what this lightweight lock does is, first off, it eliminates the need to do the flush tables. So tables are no longer flushed uh, in the, from the inodb in-memory cache. And, uh, and the, it only needs to take a metadata lock then on inodb as well as, uh, though it still does a, needs a, the full lock on all non-transactional stores, which my ISAM is. And for, for tr the purposes of Trove, it's, uh, it, it just, it, well, it depends on, like, in, their, in HP's case, they don't have my ISAM except for the system table, so that's not a big, not a big killer there. But if you, have, if you are allowing my ISAM and you've got big tables, your backups are going to be painful. So that's, that's, just, that's a really neat feature um, and um, worth using the combination for just for that. Uh, now, coming soon, what else is it? Yeah. I lost my place. Yeah, there you yeah, go. Yeah. Encryption and... Yeah, uh, coming soon. We, uh, Extra Backup currently has uh, a couple of things built into it to help, uh, to help your backups execute faster. Um, first off is, it's kind of an old feature, but it's the ability to, do, to execute backup in parallel. Um, it, can, it can copy inodb table, table spaces in parallel with a dash dash parallel option. So if you've got file per table or many multiple databases, it can actually copy from multiples and stream them at the same time. After reading and writing, um, uh, reading from the uh, inodb and pumping it through the output chain, it can also inline execute uh, lightweight compression and symmetric encryption, um, each of which can be put into multiple threads. So if you've got the CPU power to do it, you can be, you can be doing a compression and encryption in parallel rather than just in a single serial stream. And that is for each parallel backup pump, as we kind of call it. Uh, coming soon is uh, asymmetric encryption. Um, we've actually had the feature kind of ready for a while, but we had some issues with uh, a bug in the, uh, in the library that we use for it uh, on certain distros. So it's been kind of on hold for that. Um, and just as mentioned earlier, just released into alpha is now we have a, our own baked uh, version written in C of, uh, I think they're calling it XB Cloud is the, exec is the binary. And what it will do is it will take an incoming XB stream off of extra backup, break it apart, and in parallel push it out to the Swift object store. Uh, it maintains a, uh, a basically a manifest of where it put all the different blocks so it knows how to reconstruct them, and then it will go, you can use it as well then to go pull and, re and recreate a, a backed up data set. Okay, cool. Question, any questions on any of that stuff? We're right kind of out of time. <laughs> so. Right on time. So um, tomorrow during the design summit, or either tomorrow or Friday or whatever, if we have, any, have some time with the group, some of the stuff, particularly with the backup, uh, we'd, I'd like to bring up to see if, there's, if we can improve the user experience with yeah, the backup space and with some of these new features. A lot, a lot of these features, they're not fully baked into Trove either. So like HP runs a lot of these features, but they're not natively in Trove. So we, tomorrow we should probably talk about getting some of these features added to Trove. Uh, so that's available for everybody. Yeah, and we, we have a lot of really good guidelines on you know, how to set baseline values for like with backup if you're gonna get into various threading options. Um, you know, and it, there's, there's the balance and trade-off of, you know, do I want my backup executed fast and I don't care what it does to the server, or I want my backup, I don't care how long it takes, but don't touch the servers, don't, don't impact the server's ability to do its job. So there's a, there's a balancing act that, that goes on there, and we have a lot of, lot of options that we can use to, to tweak that. So 
Okay, cool. Well, thank you. Thanks, guys. Thanks for coming. <laughs> Two hours to the party. Two hours. Bus is out front at 7 o'clock. <laughs>